This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the Columbia Democratic Club, and we tonight are having our forum for our state delegates and our candidates. I wanted to thank everyone for coming in. Um, before we jump in and get started, I did want to do quick introductions. I'm sorry, as a courtesy. Do we have anyone um, running for office that is not part of this forum? So you're not a state delegate. Um, if we could uh, very quickly, I would acknowledge, it looks like Colin Sullivan is running for central committee. You say hello right quick. Hello. Okay, that was great. <laughs> you said right um, quick, I'm trying to follow orders. Okay, very good. Um, and then let me see, do I have, I see a lot of delegates on here. So I'm just kind of scrolling through. Um, have I skipped, it looks like Dan Newberger. Hey everybody, good luck tonight, delegates. Okay, hey. thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that is everyone. Have I forgotten Senator, anyone? Senator Lamb is on. Senator Lamb is on. Okay, thank you very much. Senator Lamb, you say hello? Okay, he may be muted. Okay. And, um, and Courtney and, Watson as well is, she's um, not in a contested race, so she's not in the forum, but she's on the call. She's on yep. the call. I'm really grateful that you're with us tonight. And okay. Elizabeth is on. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Fitch running for re-election to the Orphans Court. Um, if you haven't heard, we for formed the first ever all-attorney um, candidate slate. It's myself, Ajili Brown, and Christina Bostic. And um, glad to see you all. Very nice. Glad to have you. Thank you. OK, how is that everyone? Cynthia, this Hi, is um, Jackie. Linda Bowl is on. Yep. And this is Jackie. I'm on. Um, I was off camera first, uh, just running Democratic Central Committee. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hi, and I'm Linda Bolin. I'm also running for Howard County Democratic Central Committee. Okay. Thank Hi. you very much. I'm Carla Tavolo. I'm also running for Democratic Central Committee. Okay, very good. All right, I think that is everyone. So oh, let me get back in here. So again, we're going to start with District 13, and then we're going to 12A, and, I mean 9A, forgive me, and then 12A. So what we're going to do is go ahead and start with introductions, if we would. Um, Vanessa Atterbury, thank you for joining us, running for delegate in District 13, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes, is this where I have my three minutes? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am Delegate Vanessa Atterbury. Um, I think most of you know that I was born and raised right here in District 13. And it is an honor for me to and a privilege for me to be running for reelection for my third term. It's gone by pretty quickly um, to represent the area in which I grew up in and am now raising my wonderful three children in who are 10, 8 and 7 who are at soccer and hopefully they won't come crashing in here behind me. Um, but I am a graduate of Athelton. Um, I am running with Team 13, which is my current colleague running for re-election, -elect Delegate Jen Terrassa, um, and our newcomer, um, Pam Gazzoni. Um, and you'll hear Jen and I argue about who had the best high school, because I say it was Athelton. Um, I spent my first seven years on the Judiciary Committee, uh, three as vice chair. And there I was um, really able to do a lot of great work uh, when it comes to strengthening our domestic violence laws, passing background checks for rifles um, and shotguns for all long guns. And finally, I've moved on from judiciary, but finally after seven years, um, I was able to increase the age of marriage from 15, 16, 17 um, here in, in, in the state of Maryland. And I could talk about that for an hour. So if you want to talk about it, feel free to contact me um, offline. Um, I spent this past uh, session in my new role uh, as chair of the Ways and Means Committee, where I serve with Delegate Feldmark, who is uh, amazing. And we did some great things. Um, it, it was all new to me, um, but we did some great things in terms of education. 
um, I was able to help shepherd through some great um, tax um, incentives um, and reductions in sales taxes for working families, for medical products, diabetes products, um, uh, products related to babies um, and taking care of babies. We also uh, did the 30 day gas tax relief that you may have heard of. Um, that's the consensus that, that the governor and the Senate and the House could agree on. And we also passed um, kind of a misnomer. It's called the retirement tax, but you just have to be uh, 65. So we were able to do some great work um, there. I also feel like I've kind of started to put my stamp um, on the education policy that we passed. We passed um, uh, sexting and human trafficking so that it's uh, incorporated into our health curriculum um, uh, in middle school and high school, which it wasn't before. And given my background in judiciary, I thought that was really, really important. So I'm looking forward to the questions. Um, as chair, I'm very cognizant of the time, so I don't want to disrupt the time and having to kick people off. It's always kind of awkward. So I look forward to the questions and thank you again uh, for having me here this evening. Cynthia, you're muted. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And that is Vanessa Atterbury running as an incumbent and delegate uh, for District 13. Next up, we have Jen Terrassa. Again, your introduction, running for delegate in District 13. Great, thank you. And good evening to everyone. As most of you know, I, um, for my 12 years on the County Council, now four years in the state, I'm serving as a state delegate um, from District 13. I'm Jen Terrassa. And thank you, Cynthia, and all the members of CDC for putting this together. It's really great to be here among friends. Um, I'm running to continue serving my community as I have for nearly two decades, because I think it's critical that we have a str have strong, experienced, uh, sorry, consistent, progressive voices in the Maryland State Legislature. And I know what it takes to be successful in Annapolis. Um, as I know Vanessa does as well. Um, I have a reputation for speaking up and asking difficult questions, for being persistent um, um, and for standing um, up for people, especially those who feel that they have no voice, even when it's not popular to do so. And I'm always thinking about those voices that need to be amplified and how what we're doing is impacting them. I also have a reputation for excellent constituent services and I'm known for working well with my colleagues. Um, for those of you who don't know me as well, I live in King's Contrivance. I have three kids who all graduated from Hammond High School, and I am the proud graduate of Oakland Mills High School. Yes, um, Vanessa and I fight about that often, but Oakland Mills is the best high school. Um, I think um, one, of my, one of the folks running in District 13 might agree with me. Um, <laughs> um, um, I'm a lawyer, and after law school, I did two clerkships, one at the Court of Appeals and one in the Circuit Court, and I... Um, one of the co-leaders of the Progressive Policy Forum in Annapolis. In terms of my committee work, I work on the Environment and Transportation Committee, which addresses issues such as, oh, I'm looking for the clock. I wanna make sure I'm paying attention to that too, which addresses housing and real property issues, land use, ethics issues, transportation, obviously, local government issues. And we also do ethics. I worked on the Appropriations Committee my first year, and that really gave me a background um, I learned really how the state budget is put together. I learned that that's not necessarily the committee I wanted to be on, but it is was definitely a good background for me to understand how everything else fits together. Um, what else can I tell you in 46 seconds? As a legislator, my top priorities have been addressing issues such as equity, housing, disability rights, climate change, and the climate change crisis, which we work on a lot in my committee. Um, I stand up for our shared values and address our community's concerns by being a consistent voice for improved access to healthcare, better transportation, and more transparency in campaign financing. And I look forward to your questions. And again, it's good to be among friends. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That's Jen Tarasa running as delegate in District 13, also an incumbent and a fellow Scorpion. So good job. <laughs> Next up, we have Pam Gazzoni running as a delegate. Uh, I believe she just joined Team 13. So your introduction, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here this evening. Um, I've been a member of this Columbia Democratic Club for years and years, and uh, it's great to see a lot of um, friends who've been around for a long time and a lot of new people as well. Um, so I'm probably introducing myself to some of you, even if you've known me for a long time, you may not actually know that much about me. 
Um, some of you know that I grew up in Massachusetts, but I've been here in Howard County for over 30 years now. Um, and uh, I um, am a long time uh, public service oriented person. Um, my parents were both teachers. My dad was the assistant superintendent of schools in the school district that I grew up in. Um, so education, public service kind of in my bones. Um, when I moved down here to Washington DC and then got my master's um, at the University of Maryland College Park um, and then moved to uh, the Columbia area a couple of years after that, um, I was working at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center where I was for a little over 30 years. I retired from there um, in December of 2019. Uh, I often tell people that I had about four separate careers there, um, but there were underlying skills and abilities that were um, throughout all of them, which included problem solving, team building, um, consensus building, and stakeholder awareness, st stakeholder analysis. Um, so I have a lot of experience working on complex problems um, that often required working with people who had very different points of view and coming, trying to do our best to come to consensus to um, solve the problems and move forward. Um, within the community, um, again, I've been actually in District 13 my entire time that I've been in Howard County. Um, I live in, in Owen Brown now, um, but for many years was in King's Contrivance. All three of my kids are proud Hammond graduates. Um, so I'm gonna be the voice of Hammond here this evening. Um, I was a parent in Hammond High School for 10 years straight um, and will be a Golden Bears fan and proponent um, until the day I die, I expect. <laughs> I've also been on the board of the Arc of Howard County for um, about a decade um, and have been an advocate and very involved in the developmental disabilities community um, and which, which also involves um, uh, the autistic community here in the county. Um, that's primarily with adults, but have, I have a fair sense of the knowledge uh, issues with regard to special education as well. Um, I'm also currently on the Commission for Women um, here in Howard County and secretary of that. A um, number of other nonprofits that I've been involved with over the years include the uh, Hope Works. I was on the board when it was still the Domestic Violence Center. Um, I've been involved in the courageous conversations on race and religion here in the county for all five years that that program has been going on. Um, and I work with um, a program here in the county called Leadership Essentials, where I do um, coaching with emerging leaders in the county. Um, I've been doing executive and leadership development coaching for over a decade as well. Um, so I am looking forward to the questions this evening um, and um, excited to be part of this and thank the CDC and Cynthia and Linda and um, Don for all of your work to pull it together. Well, thank you, Pam. And um, so Cynthia actually got pulled away for a second um, for another work emergency. So I'm gonna take over um, for, for a few minutes and then hopefully, um, hopefully Cynthia will be back. Um, but hold on, I got to stop the timer multitasking. Um, so, okay. So, um, thank you, Pam. And so next, um, we'd like to hear an intro from, uh, Becca Nyberg. Becca, Hi, Paul. Yeah, I'm here. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, thanks to Cynthia in the ether, um, Dawn, the rest of the board uh, for putting everything together. So again, you know, lots of familiar faces on here. Wonderful to see you, even if it is through a computer screen. Uh, as an attorney, I work with the laws every single day. I see how they work and I see how they don't work. And I've spent a lot of time advocating for the outside and things to change. Uh, I started with, well, I started in the Court of Special Appeals in Maryland, but then I quickly moved to federal service serving in the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security, where I became not only an immigration expert, but an expert on human trafficking. Um, and I focused on gender-based issues throughout my career, taking a lot of domestic violence-based pro bono cases, advocating in that space as well. So now I work for a nonprofit running the Legal Services Department, and again, I get to work with these laws that are formed every single, every single day. I've seen clients that have problems from things as diverse as getting a driver's license to getting a job because of a, a criminal, not even conviction, but a criminal charge on their record. And these are things that are very, that should be very easy to fix. This should be on the foremost of any legislator's mind, but from the outside, I've only been able to get so far with that. So it was a natural step for me to run for delegate and to hopefully close some of these loopholes and make some of these laws work the way that the legislators originally intended them to do. 
as in the county, uh, I've, I've kind of been everywhere. I serve as an at-large board member of the Howard County NAACP. I serve as the logistics coordinator for Pride, which is coming back this year, which is super exciting. Uh, I also serve as Beth Shalom's liaison to PATH, and I serve on my um, HOA in Emerson down here in Laurel, where I live with my two kids who may come busting through the door behind me at any given time, although they have been given strict instructions to uh, to stay outside and not disrupt until dinner is ready. So we'll see how that goes. I will fall on the Atterbury train for Athelton, since that is where my my children will be attending when they finish middle school um, down here in Laurel. And we are very committed members of the community down here in Laurel um, and in Savage and Jessup, which is very close, as well as you know the Southern Columbia neighborhoods, all of which that make up District 13. So my, my priorities, un unsurprisingly, will be on focusing on those communities that have historically been left out of conversations and make sure that they they get the best education, environment, economic benefits, healthcare, and all of those things that we all strive for. So I look forward to, to questions and I will leave it there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Becca. Sorry, I had to switch from turning off the timer to unmuting myself, um, but thank you. And um, last but not least, um, we have uh, Amy Brooks. Hi, everybody. I am originally from Pennsylvania, but I moved to this area when I went to Towson University. I wanted to be anything but a teacher. My dad was a principal and my mom was a special ed teacher. But once I got into advertising, I realized that was not my jam. And I started tutoring and then I was uh, subbing and I got totally sucked into teaching full time in Baltimore City Public Schools for half of my 22 years of uh, teaching so far. So I love high school. I've also taught at Lake Elkhorn Middle School. I'm currently at Oakland Mills High School. And this was not a legacy I thought I would give to my kids, but my son this week was just voted most likely to be a teacher, which is shocking to me. Uh, he is a senior. He is graduating and going to Towson University. I think he'll be great. He's um, my pride and joy along with my other two sons. I have a sophomore, both of them go to Oakland Mills High School with me, but no, I never ever teach them. And I have a, a seventh grader as well, who just hit a triple and I left right before he did it, so bummer. Uh, in addition to teaching, I've been doing a lot of community advocating for years. I know what our communities need because they're all coming in through the school doors. Almost all of our communities are connected to our schools in some form or fashion. There's a lot of investment in communities based around our schools, whether they should or not. Um, public education is the answer in my mind to all of our problems. We can funnel resources and and so many other benefits to our community at large through our school system or even just our school facilities. I'm definitely the educator in District 13. I want to represent our community in Annapolis because I am very in touch with the people that our laws and our policies impact the most. I am excited that so many of my students are excited about my candidacy because I tell them all the time, the government is us. And even though I'm a political outsider as you know, a working class person with a working class husband um, and children that we have divided the childcare up evenly, it's really important to me that we're represented in our representative, I'm sorry, in our places of governance, let's say that. Um, I've been PTSA president for Oakland Mills Middle School. I'm currently a PATH member and I participate on the NAAC Education Committee and the OMCA Education Committee. Um, when the pandemic hit and closed down our schools, I started Oakland Mills Online, which is an online platform for learning and education because our school system told us not to communicate with kids and that didn't feel great. So since then we've had hundreds of workshops over the last few years run women's retreats, intergenerational mentoring. Um, and now we have a Scorpion speaker series, which is spread throughout Howard County Public Schools. The number one issue for voters in Maryland is education. And I would like to be a voice in the room where decisions are being made about our schools and our kids. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Um, so let me just ask really quick, is Cynthia, are you back? No, 
Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead then with, with the questions. Um, so it's going to be the same question for, for all of you. Um, so, and it will save time if I don't have to repeat it. I will if I need to when we get to sort of the last person, but, um, but you know, if possible, everybody pay attention to the questions so that you're ready to answer and we'll just, you know, we'll, then we can just move things along. So this time I'm going to start with, um, with Jen Terrassa. And the question for all of you is, um, the Columbia Democratic Club is committed to fighting discrimination and advancing social justice. Do you share this commitment? And if so, what's an example of something that you've done already in the past to advance these values in our community? So we will start with Delegate Terrassa. Thank you for the question. I appreciate that. And um, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that as a, frankly, as a um, driving force from my perspective. So you want one example of that? I mean, there's so many things that um, we've worked on. I'm trying to figure out which one thing um, to pick on in terms of advance, uh, pick on, pick up, <laughs> pick to talk about. I mean, I think one of the things that I'm most proud of working on is the Citizen Election Fund. Um, and that was something that allowed more candidates access, more people are able to participate in the system. And from my perspective, that was so important because there's so much money these days in politics. And it's something that this, um, we couldn't get money out of politics, but what it did is allow small donors to have a voice. And, and I didn't warn you that you might hear my son singing at some point, but he is singing in the background. Um, um, and that, that's one of the things that I'm really proud of, but there's a lot of things that we worked on. One, one of the things that I worked on when I was in the County Council um, was Healthy Howard. We were um, pre-Obamacare. We were doing that on a county level and I was one of its biggest champions. I also championed the first living wage bill um, one of the first living wage bills in Howard County, which I passed along with um, our county executive, Calvin Ball. Um, another one was our CB9, our work on immigration. Um, and we hope to, to get that passed. Unfortunately, this council was able to do that. Um, do I have a minute and a half? Because I could talk about a couple other things if I do. Um, no, but I actually, I'm sorry. Can, I forgot to reset the timer, and it was only supposed to be two minutes. So okay. I will give you a little bit more time, but right. like, I, I apologize. <laughs> on the state level, I mean, there's been so many other things. I've been working on um, campaign finance also at the state level. We did police accountability. I had a, a bill to eliminate small state bills, uh, um, small state fees and probate that I've worked on with Byron and McFarland. And I do see that my time is up. So I'll leave anything else I want to talk about till later. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And so now let me reset the timer so it's correct for, for the rest of the time. And um, let me ask again, Cynthia, are you back? No. Okay. So then let's go to Pam for our next person to answer this question. And um, hopefully you remember the question, but let me know if you need me to repeat it. No, we're good. Thank you. Um, uh, working on issues of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, discrimination um, is an area that I've been working on for, at this point, getting close to two decades. Um, and my work started when I was at NASA and um, took a position which was only supposed to be for a year, ended up being for about three and a half to four and changed the course of my career. Um, NASA got its Space Flight Center specifically had um, a class action suit brought against it with regard to disparate impact on um, moving to the senior promotion levels of African American scientists and engineers. And I was oversaw and managed all of the programmatic changes that were required through that class action settlement. Um, so that included a complete overhaul of the promotion process. Um, to those senior levels. So for people who work for the government, the levels to GS-14 and GS-15. Um, we changed up the, the um, excuse me, performance appraisal process and the ways that um, training and career development were managed for folks at the younger level, at the more junior level and then up through the senior level as well. And the work was, um, was incredibly interesting, very um, challenging to bring all of the parties together and we sort of came out with three words at the end that I still sort of have in the background of my mind all the time, fairness, transparency, and accountability. Um, so for, for change in, in that space, those were the 
um, sort of values that we were really moving towards. Since then, I've been involved also with Goddard in the development of um, a workshop series around power and privilege and specific to race. Here in the county, I've, um, as I mentioned earlier, have been involved in the Courageous Conversations process. That includes being um, involved with um, sort of planning and developing the questions and um, and understanding the process and how that all runs for the for the folks that are involved. And over, I'm going to say hundreds of people at this point have been involved in that process in the county over the years. I've also led some workshops um, around um, DEI issues um, and particularly in um, in the Leadership Essentials Program so that leaders that are moving up in the process understand those issues, know how to um, work with as many people as possible um, and understand their role as a leader with regard to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so uh, the other piece of that, which comes at it from a little bit of a different angle um, is that I have been involved with the develop developmentally disabled community for a long time, which is another area where um, advocacy and social justice and opportunities for that constituency is an ongoing challenge and um, have been involved in that and advocating for that for a long time. Great. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, Thank you. So next, I would like to go to Becca Nyberg. Yeah, so it's an interesting uh, question. And I mean, of course, I'm committed to fighting discriminant discrimination and advancing social justice, because I literally do it all day, every day um, in my job. Um, I only briefly went into private practice because I just couldn't take money from people who were struggling and had been through so much. All of my clients are minorities, not only in immigration status, but in language ability and in their country of origin, their race, most of the time their religion, though not always. And it's something that I'm committed to not only in work hours, but then I also started advocating outside of my paid positions as well. I got involved in NAACP because I just kept showing up. Um, as a leader of Together We Will, it was very important to me, instead of to barge into spaces where people had been doing work for decades or longer, I wanted to make sure that we were listening to the communities and making sure that we were doing things that the communities wanted us to do instead of what we thought the community should want to do or thought would be best from our perspective from the outside. So I just kept showing up and Willie Flowers, the head of the NAACP said, well, if you're gonna keep showing up and you're gonna keep doing this work, you might as well sit on the board and you might as well be involved in this. And that's how I got to be on the Howard County Pride uh, board as well as I just kept showing up because it is so ingrained in me and so important to me to stand up for people who may not otherwise be able to stand up for a variety of reasons. So it is not only something that I'm committed to, but it is something that I live and breathe every day and my heart beats for it. So I would continue that within the, the House of Delegates, um, or even if I you know, wasn't in the House of Delegates, I will continue doing it every single day. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, so next, if we could hear from Amy Brooks. Yikes, I wasn't muted. Uh, so I am really excited about going into different spaces, but my lane has been education for so long. So the changing of the hearts and the minds and creating safe spaces for people to explore difficult topics has been my main area of focus for such a long time. So most recently I've been the GSA advisor, that's a gender sexuality um, alliance at our school. I also work with CARI, the community um, allies for rainbow youth, and then um, I, every book that I teach, every lesson that I teach is through a lens of racial equity and centering voices of people who have been historically excluded. And that's not the norm in Howard County. I wish that it was, but it's not. So I've been working with my peers to get more of those texts to the forefront and fighting for more inclusive texts, both in our library and our schools through a lot of different fronts. Because it's such a systemic problem, um, I joined the Literature Book Review. And so we have been approving new texts by the wheelbarrow full. They're digital now, so it's a lot easier. 
Um, I've worked with training teachers and inclusive practices. I've been on the curriculum development and I've spoken up many times to get more teachers um, who are not just cisgender white women in those spaces because they're not there. Um, it's happening again and again in our school system. And that's a fight we can't ignore even if it hits close to home in areas where we think we're doing really well in Howard County. I've been serving on the, I did serve on the UUCC board for many years and we worked within our congregation to be more introspective and inclusive and proactively fighting for justice. The Howard County Library has a racial equity alliance and I'm working right now with a subgroup um, with folks even from our DEI office in the county. And we're trying to set up a lot of different programs that we've done through OMO, like the intergenerational mentoring that I talked about, because you can't just learn about it. You need to get the pipeline in effect uh, ready for the next generation of our young people. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Um, and last but not least, um, Delegate Atterbury, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. So this is an interesting question because uh, for me, it's it's a very personal question because I'm an African-American woman and I'm raising three African-American uh, children, two of whom are boys um, and one, one beautiful little girl. And so for the past seven years, I've been able to do a lot of work on the Judiciary uh, Committee. I've worked uh, closely with uh, CASA, helping the immigrant population. Um, I think uh, Pam mentioned courageous conversations when we were having problems right here in Howard County, it was Congressman Cummings who came to me and said, Vanessa, we need to do something about this. Um, and I went to the faith community and we started Courageous Conversations. Um, but I think the most prolific thing um, that I had the honor of doing and the most, um, I guess, substantial thing that I have done uh, in Annapolis so far was to chair the police reform and accountability work group uh, in 2020 uh, after the murder of George Floyd. Um, and the, the, our Speaker of the House appointed me uh, to chair that work group. Um, and it started out as a work group. And then um, the, the recommendations moved through the House of Delegates through the normal process. Um, at that time, I was on the Judiciary Committee and they came to my subcommittee. Um, and we just worked really hard um, to, to create um, some sweeping police reform. Um, we mandated by cameras uh, throughout the state of Maryland. Uh, we, we repealed the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. We created implicit bias testing and training. Um, we created transparency uh, in police records. We changed uh, the standard for no-knock warrants um, and other warrants. We have lots of little nuggets too. We created to try to recruit minorities. We created scholarships um, and loan repayment programs. Um, we, we created mental health programs um, to help our police officers. Um, so I think that is the most important, um, and it was the most personal uh, uh, experience that I've had in the General Assembly, because as I moved through that experience, I thought of my children, I thought of my brother and my father and the experiences that they've had right here in Howard County um, that were, were not positive experiences. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so our next question, and um, I'm going to start this time with Amy Brooks, um, but this is again going to be the same question for everyone, um, is what does the term environmental justice mean to you, and will it be a priority for you as a legislator, and if so, how? Um, so Amy, do you want to tackle that one first? So environmental justice is uh, really important to me. We've been doing a lot of work at our school in particular, um, getting more students involved with outdoor spaces. We raised uh, over $20,000 just to build an outdoor classroom to get people reconnected with the environment. Part of the problem is people don't understand how bad things have gotten. So education is, is key. But I know that um, a lot of times when we think of environmental justice, we skip over the racial component. And uh, historically, we have taken a lot of the pollutants and a lot of the um, negative waste that is impacting our society at large, and we've segregated it to, to a specific area, or we have um, taken areas that are populated by groups of people who don't necessarily have the same political power and we have decimated very important places. So I'm speaking broadly because I don't have a lot of time, but to me, environmental justice is one, learning about the issue and the social impact, everything from lead poisoning my students suffered from in Baltimore City, um, all the way up through asthma and other um, environmental contagions. 
uh, seeking justice for those students and their health care is one example of acknowledging this environmental harm and then um, making sure that there is some sort of repair. The second thing is looking at our institutional environmental harms and how we have to have an institutional response to those. And instead of asking people, it's very nice to say everybody recycle and drive a Prius. I do both of those things, but that is not going to turn back the clock on um, some of the bigger issues that come from construction, that come from destroying land that cannot be, um, we can't get back. You know, there are lots of different ways that we can address this and benefit both builders and the community. It doesn't have to be a loss for everybody. It could be a win-win-win if we do it right. Great, thank you so much. Um, so next, I'd like to ask the same question to Becca Nyberg. Uh, so environmental justice for me is the fair treatment of everybody regardless of what whatever demographic we wanna put on them, whether it's race, whether it's um, income level, whether it's national origin, it's that everybody is treated that same way when we're talking about all sorts of things, not only you know, where we're putting our waste, but the implementation, the enforcement of environmental laws, you know, it, it's, it's much more broad than you know, just looking at one particular aspect, we really do have to look at it from a really holistic approach, especially when we're looking at things like climate change, where the people who are going to be disproportionately affected by climate change are lower income, which means a lot of minority populations. So we have to focus not only on, you know, the things that Amy was saying, you know, doing our part individually, but also looking at, you know, making sure that companies are doing their parts as well. And that means enforcing the laws and making laws that are stronger, making sure that our state is a green state so that we aren't, you know, as a collective contributing to the problem. You know, it, there's a great example um, very close um, to my house down in District 13, which is the milk plant. So the Virginia DC Maryland Milk Cooperative has a plant here to process, pasteurize, pasteurize their milk before it goes out onto the shelves. Every time the, the milk plant, their scrubbers break, you know, part of their environmental controls, there's a great swath of area in Laurel that gets to smell basically rotten milk. And what happens is that instead of fixing those scrubbers and fixing those environmental measures, the plant continues to operate with impunity. Um, and that's a very easy place to say, and just a small microcosm of how we aren't enforcing those same environmental rules to our businesses. And that's something that we need to increase to focus on to make sure everybody has a clean environment in which to grow up and to raise their families. Sorry, thank you so much, Becca. Um, okay, so uh, next I would like to ask the same question to Jen Terrasa. Thank you. I really appreciate the question. Um, environmental justice, uh, from my perspective, um, is something, it is really a recognition that some have suffered much greater impact from the climate crisis that we're in. And so, what uh, can you repeat the, the question? Is and then what would you do about it? Is that, was that the second half? Yeah, of it, it will be a priority and in, in what will you do yeah, about it's it? Absolutely, absolutely, it's a priority. It's something that we work very closely on in my committee. Um, we did some really important legislation this year to deal with the climate climate crisis um, this year with Climate Solutions Now. It was landmark legislation setting achievable goals to reduce greenhouse gases and meet the goal of net zero by um, 2045 and set interim goals. Sorry, I have a cat who is <laughs> mad that I haven't fed him dinner. Um, but I think from my perspective, and, and a lot, and some of it was focused on environmental justice and making things right in areas that have suffered more from those, um, from the impact. Um, but it means putting more air, money into those areas. It means putting more trees and more green spaces into those areas. Um, it, it does mean more money. It means recognizing that those areas, and I think it, I think it was Amy, but I apologize if it wasn't. We spoke about lead poisoning and asthma. It means that, that there's more money that needs to be put into those kids' lives because 
those kids are suffering more. They have educational impact. They have all sorts of other impact. Um, there, um, there are a whole host of other things that, um, sorry, I have my notes down here as part of my issue. <laughs> um, and my cat is very mad. Um, the other thing that, that one of the things that I have worked on um, in the last two years is giving the attorney general the ability to sue, sue fossil fuel companies. Because um, at this point, we know that fossil fuel companies put knowingly continue to poison our environment. And the attorney general needs the ability to, particularly with the current governor, hopefully we'll have a governor who's more cooperative in the future, but even with the, um, with the, with the future governor. Oh, I'm over time. I'm so sorry. Okay. Well, anyway, I think that'll be helpful. And I've talked to both attorney general candidates about that. And that's all. Great. Thank you. And I apologize. I, I feel like I'm juggling too much. So I stopped looking at the timer myself. Um, but so thank you. I'm glad that you noticed. Um, so next, um, I'd like to ask um, Vanessa the same question. Thank you. So to me, environmental justice means taking a look at what communities have been disproportionately affected by climate change. And what I think Delegate Trasa failed to mention is we are taking a look at that in Annapolis. Um, and I shouldn't say failed, forgot to mention. Um, we are taking a look at it and we passed legislation last year as part of the Climate Solutions Now Act. Um, the bill requires the Maryland um, Department of, of uh, the Environment in, in coordination with the Commission on Environmental Justice to address issues of environmental justice and take a look at what communities have been disproportionately affected by climate change. Um, and it defines actually into law what an overburdened um, and underserved community actually um, means. So that is part of the law. And we did take a look at that last year and pass legislation so that we can start um, to address those issues. Um, I will say, um, and, and this sort of answers the question, well, I guess the second part of the question was, do I support um, or will I make um, uh, issues related to environmental justice a priority? And absolutely. Um, for the past uh, uh, seven or eight years that I've been in Annapolis, I have always supported um, any such issues. Um, but what that when you're down there, you serve on one community, one committee, and so you're focused on that committee, and so you really rely on um, your colleagues, um, which is why it's been so wonderful to be part of a great team. And as you know, um, Shane um, Pendergrass is stepping down, but we've really relied on each other, um, and we really do work great as a team. So I can text Jen at any moment in time and say, "Hey." you know, what is up with this environmental bill because you you understand all of these issues and I don't necessarily. And Jen, as you know Jen well, is constantly texting me about any issues that might be uh, in the purview of, of judiciary and now um, uh, the Ways and Means Committee. So we have um, Jen in the environment and transportation who's been um, a leader on these issues and I certainly um, support uh, anything that addresses environmental um, justice. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and so then last, I would love to hear from Pam. So everybody's had such great answers. Um, so I, I will do the, the um, priority part first and say, yes, this would be a priority for me um, if I am uh, lucky enough to be um, elected. Um, and I, you know, I think, both, I think everybody sort of defined it well, but for me, what it really, it, is talking about is addressing environmentally based inequalities um, that are disproportionately impacting lower income communities. So that's everybody from um, folks who are on the Eastern shore that are living very close to chicken farms um, and the negative impacts that can have to folks in Baltimore city who are near incinerators or bus stations um, and have air quality that is not what it should be. Um, so it's addressing those negative impacts and, and they can be pretty um, varied, uh, but we certainly need to do that. Um, I think it's also things um, that uh, may be showing up in a more um, economic kind of way in particular communities as well. Um, I know that there's been legislation, I believe, and Jen, please jump in if I'm incorrect, um, with regard to houses, um, particularly for it, where more lower income people live um, and their higher energy costs because their houses may not be well insulated. They may have windows that aren't um, tight enough and, um, 
and type things like that. So they're paying more for energy than they maybe should be because their houses aren't um, sort of being able to be kept up. Um, and some, I'm assuming that some of that housing is rental housing where landlords should be doing a good job, a better job. Um, a couple other things. Um, I also think that one of the things that we could look at um, and the legislature could look at is um, defining and maybe getting a little tighter on the difference between clean energy definitions and renewable energy definitions. Not all renewable energy is clean. Um, so we might want to spend a little time in that space and get a little tighter. And I think people have um, sort of talked a little bit about this and hinted around it a little bit, but um, I believe that the Maryland Department of Environment has a lot of vacancies. Um, and so I would think that that might be something to really look at to ensure that the, that organization can get staffed up um, to the place where they were actually able p to be able to do um, follow up on the licensing and enforcement tasks and things like that, that would help I'm address. Stop you there. I'm sorry, Pam. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to check again, Cynthia, are you back with us yet? No? Okay. All right. So I'm going to go to the next question. And um, so next one, I'm going to start this time with, um, uh, with Jen Terrassa. Um, and the question is, um, in light of the leaked Supreme Court decision on, abor on abortion rights, do you think that we are doing enough at the state level to protect reproductive freedom, or do we need to do more? If you think we need to do more, what specific types of legislation will you sponsor or support? So, Jen, can you take that one first? I absolutely can take that first. And um, boy, like that is an upsetting issue for all of us, I know. Um, I'm glad to live in Maryland. Um, we have done a lot. We, um, it, abortion is legal in Maryland and um, as long as we can help it, it will be. Um, this year we passed good legislation to expand access to abortions. One of the things I was shocked to find out, and this may not be a surprise to any of you all, and I apologize that I did not know this, but that we have nowhere to get an abortion in Howard County. I don't know why I didn't know that. Um, I, it, it hasn't come up for me personally, but it is, um, it is something that um, I always thought there was access and that there was access in, in all places in Maryland. And so when we started working on this bill, I worked on um, a committee that was working on the bill along with Ariana Kelly this, this past year and that she filed and, and did pass that expands access by expanding who can give, who can provide abortions, for it, it requires, um, and unfortunately, I don't have my notes in front of me now because I have a cat sitting on them, but, um, but requires um, the insurance companies, it provides for how insurance companies will, will cover them. And um, I think all of that's really important. The one thing that one, two bills didn't pass this year, and I think we could get, we should have, we should get this passed, um, is a constitutional amendment that was filed by the Speaker of the House. And I'm hoping that that will come back again next year. I was disappointed that that didn't um, pass. And then another bill that we had that I wish had passed and hopefully will come back is one by Nicole Williams. I see I'm running out of time, but um, which would have prevented women from being criminally charged um, for an abortion or for miscarriage or stillbirth or any of those types of things. So there's definitely more that we can do um, we have to be a safe space for that here in Maryland and continue to be, and what a scary time it is. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so next, I would like to um, ask the same question of um, Vanessa. I think um, it is absolutely, Jen hit it on the head, a scary time um, for women and who, who knows who's next on the chopping block. Uh, I think in the House of Delegates, we had uh, former Speaker Mike Bush and Speaker Adrian Jones had the foresight uh, to, to, I don't know, see what was coming down uh, the road and both were able to get through the House, but we couldn't get it through the Senate, um, a constitutional amendment that the people could have approved on the ballot, um, guaranteeing women um, certain we reproductive um, freedoms. Uh, the new vice chair of the Health and Government Operations, uh, Health and Government uh, uh, Committee is a really good um, friend of mine and she's very passionate about these issues. It was already mentioned. Um, she passed legislation that expanded um, access to abortion care. Uh, I think that something else that we could do uh, that uh, Delegate Trasa touched on was 
um, make sure that we have a certain um, uh, a number of access locations um, per geographical areas. Um, however, uh, we, we choose to do that. I think that's critical um, because uh, all women deserve uh, to have, have that choice. Um, I worked with um, Delegate Williams on her legislation um, that was uh, preventing women from being criminally charged or, and I shouldn't just say women, um, anyone who drives someone to get an abortion could be charged with a crime um, and preventing um, folks from being sued for providing, um, providing abortion. So I do look forward um, to her passing that legislation uh, uh, as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so next I'd like to go to uh, Amy. Thank you. So when you said on a state level, the first thing I thought about is uh, Governor Hogan blocking funding for the training of more medical health personnel um, in assisting people. And one of the things that I'm thinking about is the shift in services that is going to happen for many women who need care. And they're going to be looking for safe havens, for safe spaces and states that can um, provide them with the medical services that their states are denying them. So while I'm very glad that we live in Maryland, and I'm cognizant of the fact that states around us are preparing for a potential onslaught of women who are desperate for care and maybe traveling far distances and there could be legal repercussions for them. So having some safeties and safety uh, legislation that will be provide for a safe haven for both practitioners, people receiving um, care is really important. Having more training just makes sense. So I'm very disappointed in our governor, but I also think Every time he does something ridiculous, I look to our supermajority House and Senate and think, I'm so grateful they can overturn his vetoes. <laughs> I'm so grateful that we have uh, five strong Democratic outspoken women running for um, seats in District 13. And I don't think that's going to be our problem. We're going to be anticipating the needs of our citizens. I think there's going to be um, some new challenges ahead that we've never had to face before with a constitutional, um, with a, a federal law being possibly thrown back to the states and it's gonna be a, a free for all. Um, that being said, I also think that there's so much more education that needs to happen and we need to take away the shame and stigma around abortion and really educate folks who think that women, like, I don't know, menstruate on the 15th of every month or can just hold that stuff in. We need to do like what my students are doing right now and they're doing a, a drive for tampons and pads for students and they're saying the word period over the morning announcement. Mind you, all that should be provided by the school system, just like toilet paper, paper towels and soap. And so part of this is just a really puritan look at women's bodies and who deserves to have control over them. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so uh, let's see, next I would like to go to Pam. Sure. Um, so uh, my daughter will turn 26 in a couple days. Um, and so I just want to share that she was genuinely freaked out by the leak of the um, presumed decision of the Supreme Court. Um, so I just want to put that out there because she, of course, is someone who has never thought about it being um, unavailable. So um, that also made me realize that it, it was years and years and years ago that I learned um, and became aware of and cognizant of and have had that on my mind for all the time since that this was a possibility. Um, I believe it was the 1984 presidential um, race. I was in college, so that's pretty much the only kind of time it could have been, where a friend of mine um, invited me to go with her to some sort of political event where one of the speakers, I have no recollection of who it was, but talked about abortion and the tie to the Supreme Court and the importance of ensuring that Supreme Court justices were going to be um, nominated and put onto the bench that would be supportive of Roe v. Wade and continue the support of it. So um, clearly a lot of time has gone by since I was in college, but um, that uh, unfortunate answer it seemed to has happened, has happened now. So all of this means that um, I will do whatever 
is possible to ensure that our state continues to be a safe place for women to make decisions with regard to their own body um, and have agency over those decisions. I certainly um, fully support having a state constitutional amendment around this. Um, uh, Delegate Williams, um, who I think was um, the Senate version was with um, Chair Smith um, of that particular legislation, I'll certainly support that going forward. Um, and I just think that we need to continue to try to do everything we can to make people feel safe um, in making those types of decisions, whether they're driving somebody, whether they're needing services by them for themselves um, or for a friend, a daughter, um, uh, whomever it is. So, um, so yeah, I joined with my colleagues in saying, yes, we need to support it at all costs. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pam. Um, and so then last but not least, Becca. Yeah, uh, as a former NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland board member, this is, again, a pretty easy question for me to, to answer in that I've already been working to make sure that we have reproductive freedom throughout the state. And that means, you know, without provider deserts, that means that abortion isn't the only option. Um, you know, this, the Supreme Court case potentially opens up a myriad of different issues, including restrictions on contraception availability. Um, one of the, the bills that we helped to get through as a board was to make um, contraception available in vending machines on college campuses so that, you know, women don't have to make the difficult decision of whether this is something that they want or need to do in the moment. And it's much bigger than just abortion provisions. It's making sure that reproductive health in general remains between a woman and her provider, her medical provider, and not anybody else interfering in that relationship. We have um, inadequate mental, menstrual supplies, not only in schools, but in prisons. And we've seen a high incidence of cancer among um, formerly incarcerated women prisoners because they weren't given adequate supplies and were forced to use the ticking in mattresses to make makeshift supplies to um, absorb their flow. So abortion or the abortion debate for me is, is much broader than just is abortion available, which, you know, 100% should be to anybody who feels like they, they want or need one. But it encompasses so much more about women's health and a focus on women's health and an understanding that we have to continue pushing forward, even while other states may be, may be moving backwards and making sure that it is available to people in our state making sure that the transportation to facilities, the support systems, the mental health support systems, you know, if necessary, are all there. We have to look at it in a very holistic manner and not just, is there an abortion available? So I absolutely support that. Great, thank you so much. Um, so now I'm gonna spring something on you, which is not part of the, the format that we had announced in advance, but if you were here for our um, Board of Ed and Council um, forum last week, you may have had an inkling that we might do this. We, Cynthia had the idea to do a lightning round um, where I'm just gonna ask one question and you have literally 10 seconds. So it's really like maybe a, you know, maybe a yes or no, and maybe like, you know, one sentence of, of explanation, but it really is just kind of, you know, your, your gut. Um, so um, I'm going to start with Amy. And the question is, in Howard County, our sanctuary law known as the Liberty Act has been challenged and will appear on the ballot as a referendum question in November. Would you support state legislation similar to the Liberty Act to protect the rights of immigrants? And we'll go first to Amy. Of course. Yes, we have one of the highest populations of uh, new immigrants in my high school and they're awesome and they need as much support as possible and their families by extension. And the pandemic exacerbated all of our, our ability to support them. Great, thank you so much. Um, next to Becca. Absolutely, I support immigrants every day and would love to continue doing it in such a comprehensive manner. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm having issues with my timer, but you're answering quickly, so that's good. Okay, so next lightning round, Pam. Uh, yes, I support it. Um, it just seems to be the right thing to do. Um, and I think it is a smart thing to do in terms of um, helping to negate negative consequences of people not doing some things because they are afraid they might get jammed up. Great, thank you. Um, Jen. 
next to you. Yes, I guess it's kind of obvious when it, you ask me because since I I um, filed the first round of this in CB9 and also I have supported it at the state level in the Trust Act. Great, thank you so much. And last but not least, Vanessa. Um, absolutely, uh, at the state level, uh, we've had different iterations of the, the Trust Act. Um, some years I've carried uh, the, the load um, um, myself. So absolutely, I would support that at the state level. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much. I, I apologize I'm, on behalf of Cynthia. Um, she, you know, she was pulled away for a work thing and she's been texting me saying that she thinks she's gonna be able to come back soon, but so far it looks like, she, you know, she's kind of embroiled in something. So um, I apologize that she wasn't able to um, be here with you for most of this, but really appreciate all of you joining us. Um, you're certainly welcome to stay and, and listen to the, to the next round, um, but we're gonna now turn to, um, District 9A, and we've got we've got three candidates running in 9A, um, and I'm not I haven't had a chance to scroll through the participants to see if all three of them are here. Linda, do you see are all three of them here? Yes. Fantastic. All right, so I'll give you a second to um, to pin the the new um, participants, and I've got to change my timer from 10 seconds back to three minutes for our intro, which each, each candidate is gonna get, get three minutes to introduce themselves and then, um, and then we'll do uh, questions, which will be two minutes each. Um, and I'm just repeating this just for the, for the candidates who may not have been here at the beginning. So we'll, we'll do three minutes, um, or I'm sorry, three questions where you get two minutes each and then we will, oh, we didn't take a question from the chat. Oh. I don't think there were any questions in the chat though. And so I apologize. Um, to our District 13 folks, I think I'm going to just keep on rolling at this point, but um, if people have suggested questions that they would like us to ask um, for our Delegate 9A uh, candidates, then please do put those in the chat. Um, but we're going to start first with, um, with just a three-minute intro per candidate, and I'd like to start with um, Steve Bolin. Steve, are you there? Yes, I am. Just got to find that mute button is all. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Columbia Democrat Club, for hosting this forum tonight. I am Stephen Bolden. I'm running for delegate in District 9A. And I'm running because I want to build a better, brighter, more equitable future for Maryland and District 9A. And also, we need to turn District 9A blue. And that also means keeping all of District 9 blue and to vote for Senator Katie Hester this fall and for uh, Delegate uh, Courtney Watson as well. Uh, so a little, about, a little bit about me. I'm a 27 year veteran of federal service. I was a professional intelligence officer, a researcher for NASA, an engineer for the US Air Force, and I have a doctorate's degree in electrical engineering. And a little known fact that a lot of you may not know is that I was actually a teamster at one point in my life. So I support organized labor. Uh, since retiring from federal government, I've been active in the community. I serve on the executive board for the National Alliance for Mental Illness, that's NAMI Howard County. And I'm on the executive board for the Howard County Police Department's Citizens Advisory Council. I'm also the vice commander for my U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Unit. And I serve on the Advocacy and Resources Committee for Howard County Autism Society. And a few other groups and uh, clubs around town too. Um, we also may know from some people may know that I'm also the uh, vice president for the Ellicott City and Western Howard County Democrat Club too. Uh, I just want to make note that when we started this election cycle, we all thought defending democracy might be the big topic island uh, uh, item, but little did we know, and probably not too surprising, but uh, we're going to have to defend women's rights to choose. And that's going to be a very important topic, this issue, because I think the other side is going to make a big deal about this. And we're going to see what's happening with Roe versus Wade. Uh, after the leaked memo, what happens in June. But I've made a very strong statement in support of uh, uh, women's choice. I made a video about this. I post on my social media. You're all invited to go watch that because we can't have women's, uh, a restriction on women's right to choose. We can't have the extremist viewpoint um, land here in Maryland. We have to stop that, make sure that doesn't take root here in Maryland. And beyond that, we know inflation's hurting the family budgets. We gotta do something with families, hardworking families um, they're, uh, to fight against inflation. Uh, we have to provide, I think we can all agree, most of us can agree that we have to provide a world-class education to all of our students, regardless of the zip codes they live in. And we've got to get serious about climate change, folks. 
And I want to build a renewable, clean energy, jobs building economy here in Maryland. Now, if you're with me, I'm going to need your support and vote July 19th in the primary. Um, and I have a few seconds left, so I want to make a shameless plug here. Uh, just to let you guys all know, I'm going to show, um, throw a big party here June the 7th at Manor Hill Brewing Company. Uh, it's in Ellicott City. It's in the western part of Ellicott City. And so all of you are invited to attend. There'll be more about this on my social media and public announcements later. But thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the forum. I'm Steve Bolden. I'm running for delegate in District 9A. Thank you so much, Steve. And that was perfect timing. Um, I didn't have to cut you off, so I appreciate that. Um, so next, uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Chow Wu. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we okay. can. You've got Great. three minutes. Thank you, Dan. I, I really appreciate the Democratic Club of Columbia actually put everything together, give me this opportunity to share my vision and my approach to really to serve the Howard County and the Montgomery County on the state delegate. My name is Chao Wu. Right now, I'm serving on Howard County Board of Education. And I'm a data scientist with a PhD from electrical engineering from University of Maryland. I'm a father of two, both of them in public school, second grade and sixth grade. I'm an immigrant. I've been in this country for almost 20 years. I'm a community volunteer. I've been volunteering in many local organizations since more than 10 years ago. So I think for me, the reason to serve and to run is to really try to serve the population from Montgomery County and Howard County. And uh, I served at various roads and the school board. I think I got a first kind of experience on what our educational experience during the last four years. And uh, I have worked really hard to find solutions for the both school board member and uh, the chair last year. I want to address this issue at a state level and support our teachers, our students, and our families. Second, I would have witnessed not a well-planned development, which is squeezed the limited resources from the county. I will present solutions from the state level to address the overdevelopment issue, which the final balanced growth with the consideration of jobs, schools, roads, hospitals, fire station, and many other infrastructure needs, and enhanced adequate public facility audience, APFO, is definitely needed for, for our county. The third one, pretty straightforward. I would say transportation improvement and human health issues beyond the COVID, like asthma, lead in the water, cancer with the potential link to environmental hazard or some other major concern for me. I would work to propose legislation for better transportation, a safe environment, and a safe drinking water. I think like some other candidates said before, the national climate is changing, right? And uh, how do we, on state level, to support women's rights, to support education, to support freedom. I think that's something our local and our state level should really help to really shield ourselves from the national climate in naturally focus on what we can do for our Marylander. That will be something, my main focus, and I will work hard on that. I would really appreciate this opportunity. I'm looking forward to the rest of Darla. Thank you. Terrific, thanks so much. Um, and so last, um, I'd love to hear an intro from Natalie Ziegler. Hi, thank you so much for putting this together. I really appreciate it. I know it's a ton of work. Uh, my name is Natalie Ziegler and I'm running for state delegate in District 9A. A little bit about my background. My first career was in broadcast journalism, mostly at CNN. I'm still uh, an inveterate news junkie. Um, my second career was as a small business owner. My husband and I started a jewelry manufacturing company, which took us all over the world and was very interesting. We also manage our family farm. And I learned a lot from both of those careers, but in many ways, I think my volunteer service has taught me more um, or has given me more of, a, of an impetus to wanna to run for office because they showed me so many of the things that we need to improve. There is poverty and homelessness in Howard County that I was never aware of until I became a CASA. Uh, the gaps in our healthcare system, the struggle that people have living on low wages with no benefits, so many other problems that really affect all of us even though we may not directly suffer from them. 
So I'm running because I feel called to try and do something about these things that have been driving me crazy for decades and aren't working. And because I would really like to see two Democratic delegates in 9A, I think it is time to flip this district. <laughs> Ideally, one of them would be me, but <laughs> one of the fundamental differences that I see between our two parties is that Democrats do believe in the power of government to do good things, to do the things that we can't do individually, build an interstate highway system, launch the web telescope. There are so many things that we can do when we pool our resources and our will. And in addition to that, we also believe that we have a responsibility for the most vulnerable among us and have to do something to, to level the playing field, to provide opportunity for everyone. And I think that we really need some energetic, proactive delegates who are ready to take on some of those intractable problems and deal with fallout from the pandemic, with the things that have been going on long before it. And we saw a lot of good legislation get passed, really kudos to the Howard County delegation. There have been some very good things, but there's so much more to do. I know everybody would agree with this. Um, I am dying to get to it. I am dying to go to work for, uh, for our state and our district. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, thanks to all of you for those intros. I'm just gonna ask Cynthia, are you back on? She had texted that she's she was getting ready. I, I am. Yes. Oh, hooray. Right. So <laughs> just, welcome back. I'm glad thank you're back. You. I know you're dealing with a disaster. So um, we've yeah. just done the intros for, for 9A. If you want to take over with the questions, I'd love to hand it back off to you. Excellent. I'll be happy to. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm actually going to start with 9A. The question will go to um, candidate Steve Bolin. And the Columbia Democratic Club is committed to fighting discrimination and advancing social justice. Do you share this commitment? And if so, please give us an example of something you have personally already done to advance these values in our community. And yeah, two minutes of time, correct? Yeah, Cynthia, thank you for the question. Absolutely, 100% I do. Through my work on the Police Department Citizens Advisory Council, I've actually provided testimony to the county to stand up the Police Accountability Board, and I've also championed the use of body-worn cameras. I think that will go a long way to helping police community interactions to hold our police department accountable and to build confidence in, uh, in our police department with our citizens. But on a broader level, uh, as part of my work with NAMI on the board of directors of NAMI, I was uh, during the last General Assembly Advocacy Days, I was the lead for District 9A to champion mental health access to mental health care and substance use disorder care for all citizens in Maryland. Uh, but most importantly, and, and, and this is what's, what got me last time and this time too, I knocked on a lot of doors in 2018. I've been knocking on a lot of doors this time too. And I'm a big champion to helping people with disabilities and specifically cognitive disabilities, those on the autism spectrum. And one of the things I heard in 2018, I'm hearing again this time, is parents who have children on the autism spectrum are concerned about what happens to those children after they're no longer here. And we have to help people lead independent lives as much as possible and to help these people fulfill their full potential and to provide them a safe, caring place um, when their care providers are no longer with them. But we have to start with early diagnosis intervention that lasts through K through 12 and then um, transition programs into their early adulthood and beyond. So I've been a big champion for um, uh, helping people with uh, police community relationships, uh, helping people with mental, mental health and substance use disorder um, issues and for people with cognitive de developmental issues. So I'll continue to fight for those um, if I become your state delegate. It's all thanks. Very good. Thank you very much. And that was Steve Bolin. Next up, the same question for Natalie Ziegler. And uh, would you like me to repeat the question? No, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, yes, absolutely. That that is really the basis of everything that I believe in. It, I think it really goes goes to well, all of the real problems that we have in our society. And in terms of what I've done personally, probably the most direct thing was serving as a court appointed special advocate for children in the foster care system. There is almost uh, 
no one arguably more vulnerable than a child who is in the situation of being in foster care, possibly having parental rights terminated, possibly getting adopted, possibly not. And court, court appointed special advocates have the unique role of advocating only for the best interest of the child. All of the other, the social workers, everybody else involved <clears throat> has some other imperative like family unification or you know the parents have their own set of beliefs and things they, they wanna do, but a CASA only has to care about the child. And uh, it's, it, it's a role that shows you pretty much every problem that there is in society if you do it for long enough. It's a very difficult, but um, very interesting job. And uh, yes, it certainly left me committed to fighting for those who can't fight for themselves. Thank you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. Next up, same question, Chow Wu. The Columbia Democratic Club is committing to fighting discrimination and advancing social justice. Do you share this commitment? And if so, what is an example of something you have personally done to advance these values in the community? Hey, good evening, Cynthia. Nice to see you again. <laughs> I, I would point out four points. The first one, I think that people here probably realize the difficulties the school is facing in their, in their body. So every year, the last several years, I have been really pushing for the funding for special education, provide support for our teacher. It's really special education doesn't differentiate between different groups. Everybody suffered that. So we wanna make sure we provide sufficient funding there when we have funding there, right? And then we heard about the disproportional identification of people of color and uh, students with socioeconomic uh, disadvantage overly identified for special education, right? We are uh, identify that and try to solve that issue. Second, one, I would say when the Black Lives Matter proclamation the first time proposed to the board, I'm the one of the five board members who supported that and passed that resolution. For me, I think it's important whenever we see injustice, unfair, we're going to support them. And really that's the code for the society to move forward. Third one, I would say for the first time, Amongst so many 24, 25 school districts in Maryland, we are one of the first to propose equity policy. Really, for the school system, how do we say, okay, we're going to raise the, raise the floor for every children, improve their performance. That's the priority for the school system. We need to provide a quality education to every student in our school system by pro providing equity policy and want to make sure that's always in our mind. The last one I would say, most importantly, I have been always there. By just sitting on the table, being at the meeting, I provide a unique angle for people to understand the complexity and the importance of equity for a lot of people, including myself. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Chao Wu um, running for District 9. OK, so let's start next with Natalie Ziegler. You'll go first. The question is, what does the term environmental justice mean to you? And will it be a priority for you as a legislator? And if so, specifically how? Uh, yes, absolutely. That is a huge priority. That is just a basic issue of fairness. You don't get to put your incinerator next to a bunch of poor people who can't fight the fact that incinerator is coming to their neighborhood. We now know so much more about air pollution. It truly kills people. And I think, you know, at this point, there is absolutely no excuse for allowing something like that to go on. Um, it, it, there are things, there are lots of bad things we've done to the planet. <laughs> There's no question about that. And we tend to put those things out of sight where we can sort of pretend that we're not really doing it. We don't really have to think about it, but that cannot continue to go on. First of all, we have to just stop having things like incinerators in cities. And second of all, Every, everything that we do has to have fairness as its basis. As, as a legislator, there's absolutely no excuse for favoring one particular group of people over another. It just, it's just wrong. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, same question for Chao Wu. Did you want me to repeat the question? Um, I think I'm fine. Um, I think environmental justice is really how the state providing a really enjoyable living environment for our, for our citizens. And uh, I think as I mentioned earlier, we have a, one of the biggest pandemic. But beyond that, when we get over with COVID, what other environmental issues which are leading to cause problems for our people, right? Asthma, lead in the water, and the cancers associated with some potential links to environmental hazard, which are three major concerns. And any lead in the blood in children is not safe, which will cause to some intellectual development problem. I think then other environmental hazard, which is really, when you not regulate the industry or housing development, any, anything else that will lead into that. I think then asthma is the way you really want to clean air. I think clean air, clean water, and a clean neighborhood are something really everybody treasured and everybody wants that. Beyond that, I think another big concern is really the transportation. People don't think about transportation in the environment. I think that's a part of that because it's really for people to find jobs and more job opportunities and increase the social mobility for the community, right? We need to really have fast, efficient, and safe highway to commuters. Less traffic jam means less air pollution, less fuel costs, and less mental pressure for everybody. And so uh, we need to think about that in the picture of environmental justice. We need a more accessible, more affordable, and user-friendly public transportation for commuting. And that will help us to really more, like, look around for more jobs and reduce the time on the road. We need a more back-friendly local roads, which really increase people's health and make sure that the love exercise that come back to safe environment as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, that's Chao Wu. And next up we have Steve Bolin. What does the term environmental justice mean to you? And will it be a priority to you as a legislator? And if so, specifically how? Yes, um, thank you for the question. It's absolutely gonna be a priority. And it means the equitable fair, fair treatment for all. And it's gonna start with everybody being able to participate in the exploding labor market that's gonna be created when I help build a renewable clean energy economy here in Maryland. But to do that, we have to give people the education, training, and tools to be able to participate in that labor market, and we should do that. But there's another part to this, and Natalie said it, and she hit it right on the head, is that we got to stop having people who, are, who live in underserved neighborhoods being the ones living next to trash incinerators, or their kids being the ones drinking from water fountains at school that have lead pipes or their schools don't have the air conditioning that's needed in the summertime so that they can continue their school. So it's fairness in the labor market, it's fairness um, in neighborhoods um, where they're living, and it's, it's education for all. It's equitable, fair treatment for all. So it's, I don't have much more to say on that, but it's, it, that's what it comes down to. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, that's Steve Bolin. And now for our third question, I'm actually going to start with Chao Wu. In the light of the leaked Supreme Court decision on abortion rights, do you think that we are doing enough at the state level to protect reproductive freedom or do we need to do more? And if you think we need to do more, what specific types of legislation would you sponsor or support? Thank you, Senator, for that question. I think personally, I say, my gosh, what happening for the whole country, right? We're moving backward. I think that's the problem we're having. And uh, I would definitely listen to our women legislators. I think women have the control of their body and the will. Everything that they have that liberty, freedom, and we should support that. If our legislature from the women's side want to do something, I'm totally support that. From the state level, I think it's really, we would have provided support for healthcare, right? For citizen, uh, for, for women, if they choose and um, should do something they want, anything, right? It's, it's really the, their choice. If we are limiting their choice, that's wrong. And uh, at the same time, for example, the school level, we're actually, right now, we're supporting our female students to provide the scent or the health, um, health products they need when they grow up. I think that's 
it's really worth supporting our female students all the way when they grow up. And at state level, I think we're going to continue sort of women and make sure they have their own will, free will, and the free choices, and we're going to support them with uh, the state support. And uh, same time, want to make sure people across Howard, across Maryland, right, they can come to Maryland for help if their other neighboring state is limiting their choices, limiting the will for women. So that's we want to be beacon of the change and supporting women rights. Thank you very much. That's Chao Wu. Natalie Ziegler. This is such a scary time. And I really believe that this is about so much more than just abortion rights. Um, but yes, in terms of specific things that I would like to do, I, I think one of the things that horrifies me the most are, um, well, Missouri for one, trying to pass a law that would disallow leaving the state for the purpose of getting an abortion. So that was part of Loving versus Virginia, the law that uh, didn't allow people of two different races to marry also didn't allow you to leave the state for the purpose of getting married. That starts to get into a very frightening situation. And I think um, <clears throat> along with criminalizing, helping somebody to get an abortion, we need to protect people in Maryland from being subpoenaed, from being forced to uh, testify, from being implicated in any way in the trial of somebody else in another state. Um, because that is a really creepy, um, really creepy idea. There's so many laws now that, that are sort of creating a Stasi in America, you know, where you're supposed to uh, turn in your fellow citizen. And, um, and also the, the idea of not being able to leave your state for whatever purpose you like again, is just unbelievable to me. I was just stunned when I heard that. Um, but yes, I, I, and, and of course, a constitutional amendment, absolutely. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Natalie. And Steve Bolin. Yeah, I've got it. You don't need to repeat the question, Cynthia. Okay. So, um, so a, a woman's right to choose her reproductive health care needs that's a basic human right. It's dignity, respect, and compassion. And we should codify that into our state um, constitution. I agree with Natalie. Um, we should not allow what's happening in these other states to sweep across here into Maryland. That's why it's so important for everybody to get out and vote this year and vote to turn 9A blue. We can't have the same extremist viewpoints that we see sweeping across our country with things like the Texas Heartbeat Act, which is allowing anybody to sue anybody who's helping somebody with an abortion, or what's going on in Oklahoma and other places where they're further restricting a woman's right to choose. We can't have that extremist viewpoint go on here in Maryland. We can't have a woman be charged for a homicide for having an abortion or miscarriage. Can't have that. We've got to allow women to choose the reproductive health care needs that best meets their family needs. And so we need to enshrine that into the state's constitution. We need to have, uh, we need to have uh, help women have access to family planning and care and other things that they need in their life to take care of themselves and their family. It's a health care, it's a, it's, a, it's a basic human right and it's called dignity, respect and compassion. That's all I have to say. Very good, that's Steve Bolin, thank you. All right, so those are our three questions, um, but I wanted to uh, ask a question from the chat. Um, in Howard County, our sanctuary law is known as the Liberty Act has been challenged and will appear in the ballot as a referendum on the question in November. What would your support state, led, would yeah. you support state? Yeah, I'm sorry. So did you do you want to do you want to ask a chat question before you ask one of those? Um, actually, no, I'm going to go ahead and go with this one. Okay. And then the chat question will be the one that we go with the lightning round. because I, I Oh, think OK, I'm one. sorry. That's OK. Um, so I'm going to start with, I believe, Natalie. And the question is in reference to the sanctuary law known as the Liberty Act. It's been challenged and it will appear on the ballot as a referendum question in November. Would you support state legislation similar to the Liberty Act to protect the rights of immigrants? Yes, I would. I do believe that 
our nation has to have borders, otherwise it's not really a nation. On the other hand, I really feel as though this, the anti-immigrant sentiment in this country and the way the immigration situation has been handled is unbelievably cruel, serves absolutely no one, including people here. I, I really don't understand the hatred for illegal immigrants in this country. I just don't get it. I feel as though they work at jobs that Americans don't want to work at. We need their labor. They need the jobs. I just don't understand uh, what's driving this. I, re I really don't. And I, um, I can't believe it's that people feel that they're really losing, losing jobs. I, I know that people don't really think that they're all rapists and, you know, I mean, that, that's, not, that's not realistic either. Um, and yes, I think the people who are here are, are very welcome and um, should be allowed to stay here. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, same question for Chao Wu. I think whether people come here legally, illegally, once they settle in Maryland, we need to provide that support for them to grow their family. I think most importantly, especially for the younger generation, right? Their children, they come to the same school as ours, for everybody else, they're in the same neighborhood. We need to provide the educational opportunity for, for their children as well, because they will be our future generation. And they're in the same community, the same society, and their future is our country's future. And we want to make sure the education side, we provide that. I think right now, I believe Howard County Public School System, where I'm a school board member, we're providing sufficient support for them. At the same time, we still have a lot of work to do, but I think we will continue to really provide that support to the family and the students once they're in Howard County or Maryland. That's the obligation of the, of the civil society we're doing. Okay, thank you very much, Chao Wu. And Steve Boland, same question for you. Sure. Um, so first of all, we have to have people come to this country through a legalized process of, of immigration, but we can't have people who, who are here as undocumented immigrants who are paying taxes here or good upstanding citizens here in our county and our, our district be afraid to come out of the shadows to participate in our community. We can't have them not participate with law enforcement so they become victims uh, to gangs and criminal activity and not help law enforcement help uh, keep their communities safe. We can't have them be afraid to come out of the shadows to help us with their healthcare needs because the next pandemic is gonna come upon us. We can't have them not come forward to, to tell us what's going on in their community so they can get the help to not spread the next pandemic. We gotta, you, we gotta be a little bit more compassionate about how the way, what we treat people in this country and in our district. And we gotta treat, tr start treating people with more compassion, kindness, dignity, and respect. Thank you very much. Um, that is a conclusion of our questions. We do have a lightning round as we like to do. Um, I'm actually gonna start with Natalie. Um, very direct, we'll put 10 seconds on the clock for the lightning round. Um, are we ready with the timer, Dawn? Yes, okay, timer's perfect. ready, 10 seconds. Um, very directly, what will be your number one priority as a delegate um, next session? Natalie? Education. Implementing the blueprint. Very good. All right. Next up, Chow Wu, your number one priority. I think I have two priorities. I would say one is really improve education funding and revise state funding formula and the improved APFO. That's both of them. You said APFO? APFO? Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. And next, uh, we will end with Steve Bolin. Yeah, well, before uh, recently, I would have said um, supporting education, excellence in education, uh, helping families fight the inflation budget, but now I think it's defending a woman's right to choose. Very good. And so ladies and gentlemen and everyone, this is our candidates for District 9A. We have Steve Bolin, Natalie Ziegler, and Chow Wu. That is the conclusion of that portion of the forum. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Steve. I'm looking for your party as well. <laughs> okay, so now we're ready to move into 12A. We have Terry Hill and Jessica Feldmark present. 
Um, I do believe the other candidate did not respond. They, did they RSVP or no? Because I know they're not present. No, I, I mean, I, I <clears throat> tried several times and quite honestly, <clears throat> I couldn't even find a website for him. He's, he filed with the, with the Board of Elections and I don't think he's done anything since. So. Okay, <laughs> very good. So we are gonna jump right into it with our introductions for 12A. I will start with Delegate Terry Hill. You have three minutes. All right, thank you very much, Cynthia. And thank you, uh, Columbia Democratic Club. It's um, always a privilege to be here with you guys. And I appreciate all the work that you do to make sure um, that, that candidates have an opportunity to, um, to come before the membership um, for your support and endorsement. Um, my name is Terry Hill. I was elected in 2014 to serve District 12 uh, and have been serving on the Health and Government Operations uh, Committee since that time, being reelected in 2018. I am a practicing physician and have lived in Howard County and actually in Columbia since 1969, um, which, yes, was the last century and well before many of you were born. Um, so, you know, why am I running again? Um, I'm running again because I went to Annapolis because I felt that we were entering a period um, in our nation that we would look back on and, and recognize that we had shifted in some, some major way and that it was important that all of us step up. I felt that I had a lot to offer uh, to, the, to the, the, the residents of, of the county and of the district and, and to Maryland generally. Um, partly because of my experience as a physician, where um, I have taken care of, you know, the whole gamut of people from homeless folks uh, to, you know, the wealthy of the wealthy and taking care of everything from, you know, burns to cancer to uh, cosmetic enhancements. And, and, and what that really is about is the privilege of allowing people to let you into the most personal um, parts of their lives and sharing with you those things that um, make them vulnerable and those things that frighten them. And in those relationships, I um, you know, came to understand, interestingly enough, a little bit more about politics than I knew um, just as uh, a voter and, and an advocate uh, and someone who had been um, on the fringes of, of politics pretty much for all my life. So I wanted to go to speak for those folks. I wanted to go because it was clear to me that America was moving in one of two directions and we were either going to become a more welcoming uh, egalitarian nation that lived up to those wonderful world, words of our founding document, or we were gonna become more inward, hateful and isolated. I did not see um, you know, January 6th coming. I did not see the fascism that was and is Donald Trump and the conservative Republican party. Um, I did not see it specifically, but it was clear that we were in a, in a struggle for, um, frankly, for the future of America. So that being said, what I've tried to do in my time there is to work the issues that are important um, to my constituents, uh, which is everything from, you know, trying to bring down the cost of healthcare to try and make healthcare universally accessible, um, fighting for all the issues that you spoke about tonight on the environment, on social justice, on economic justice, uh, on criminal justice. And, you know, be happy, you can, you know, go to the website, you can look at the list of bills that I've introduced and fought for in the bills that I've passed. Um, and you can give me a call, I'll be happy to talk to you about that in more detail. And so what I'm asking for is the opportunity to continue the work. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And that's Delegate Terry Hill, um, incumbent for D12. And then also we have Jessica Feldmark, incumbent for D12A. Uh, three minutes for your introduction as well. Thank you. Um, thank you to the CDC for, for hosting this forum. Thank you to all of you for hanging in there at, at the end of a, a long forum, at the end of what's probably been a long day. Uh, but I am Delegate Jessica Feldmark. Um, it is my honor and privilege to represent District 12 in the House of Delegates, and I am excited to be running for re-election in the newly created District 12A, along with my colleagues, uh, Delegate Terry Hill and Senator Clarence Lamb. And, um, you know, I think 
most of the folks in CDC um, really got to know me earlier in my political career, which was at the staff level, right? Before running for office for 16 years, I worked in county government at the staff level um, behind the scenes, and I was very happy behind the scenes, right? I got to keep my head down and work on making good stuff happen. Um, but, uh, you know, four years ago, I decided to um, step out from behind the scenes and, and run for office. And what really uh, motivated that decision was seeing what was happening at the federal level four years ago, you know, a, a year into Trump's presidency, um, you know, just seeing so many of our fundamental rights, voting rights, civil rights, reproductive rights, workers' rights, environmental rights, so many of the, you know, the things that are so um, fundamental to our democracy and our well-being um, were really under attack and at risk. And four years later, I am I'm so thankful and, and thrilled that Trump is gone, but the risk is not, right? And, and what we need, I think, in, in state leaders is, um, you know, folks who will step up to fill the breach, you know, step into the breach, uh, fill, uh, provide the, the leadership that um, we should have at the federal level, but we don't. So in the, in the absence of that, um, you know, how do we make sure that Maryland residents continue to enjoy those rights, even if they're not um, protected the way we'd like to see at the federal level. So, you know, that is um, what, what continues to motivate me uh, to run for re-election. I'm, I'm proud of the work we've um, accomplished in my first term, serving on the Ways and Means Committee, focusing on election law and tax fairness and the revenue subcommittee, looking at economic justice, um, and we've got to continue that work. And so I'm here to ask for your support to um, send me back to Annapolis to continue that work. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And that is Delegate Jessica Feldmark, incumbent running for District 12A. So let's get into the questions. Uh, we'll start with Terry Hill. Um, the Columbia Democratic Club is committed to fighting discrimination and advancing social justice. Do you share this commitment? And if so, what is an example of something you have already done personally to advance these values in our community? Um, absolutely. Uh, I share um, that commitment. It's, it's um, sort of my lifelong work in many ways. Um, you know, even before I became elected, it was really important to me to make sure that the voices that often go unlistened to, I'm not even gonna say unheard, but unlistened to, um, had the opportunity to speak more loudly. And so, you know, I was proudly, even though I was a member of CDC and worked really hard with, um, you know, uh, the Democratic uh, uh, organizations here in the county, I was a founding member of the Thurgood Marshall Democratic Club. And that organization was founded specifically to make sure uh, or at least to give the opportunity for the African-American community. And then we later extended it to, frankly, all folks of color uh, in Howard County had an opportunity to have their voices heard, had an opportunity to be considered for appointments on boards uh, you know, and, and, and commissions and to, to run for elected office. Um, I'm really proud of that achievement. And it was while I was the voter services chair on the Thurgood Marshall Club, that uh, I came back having heard about voter suppression laws that were being passed around the country and said, this is our civil rights issue. Uh, this is really critical and um, orchestrated um, uh, for the club a series of workshops, um, which we called um, the Summer Explosion, uh, education and information uh, about voting and voting rights. Um, the first forum was headed or uh, opened by Elijah Cummings. And it was at that time as we began to do that work that again, what I said to you earlier, this sense that, that, that I needed to step up my game that frankly, all of us, and I know there are many people who, you know, the last four, eight, 12 years have, have, have required that you come off the bench too. 
Um, so even before getting in, getting to Annapolis, I've I've dealt with those issues in terms of my legislative work. Um, you know, all the things I do are with with a, a lens of equity uh, and trying to make sure that we're addressing. Mary, I'm so sorry, I have to stop you. I don't okay. Know if it, is the timer still showing? Because I we had an issue with this last time. We have ten more minutes. I see it now. I was at a I was at a shrunken screen. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Nope. No problem. I apologize, but I want to keep us moving. Okay. All right. Well, I would thank you for the answer, Terry Hill. Next, Jessica Fellmark. Um, same question. Do you need me to repeat the question? No, I'm good. Thank you. Um, sure. And uh, and to answer it, uh, yes, absolutely. Those are priorities that I share and um, really priorities that have guided my legislative work through my first term um, in terms of you know everything from Delegate Atterbury spoke uh, earlier about um, you know the police accountability work um, that we did last year um, in in ways and means focusing on education, looking at educational equity in um, the blueprint and other policies um, you know, prohibiting uh, discrimination in private schools that uh, receive public dollars, um, you know, working on um, funding for HBCUs. Um, just this uh, past session, I sponsored the Inclusive Athletic Attire Act to make sure that student athletes have the ability to modify team uniforms for religious uh, reasons or modesty. Um, you know, and I, I mentioned earlier um, in my intro, on the Ways and Means Committee, I, I serve on the Revenues Committee. And so tax policy is not something that a lot of people think is really sexy, but it's so important to economic justice and um, you know, really looking at how uh, regressive existing policies are, how we correct that, um, how we make sure that tax incentives we're giving to private corporations are, are going to support good jobs that pay living wages and strengthen our communities. Um, you know, one quick example, um, last year, you know, when the when the COVID Relief Act came to the House out of the Senate, um, uh, undocumented immigrants were completely left out of that bill. And we worked really hard in ways and means to expand the earned income tax credit, which was being increased um, in that bill to I-10 filers. And, um, you know, we, it, it ended up being a companion piece of legislation. It didn't work in, in that bill because of the governor, but, but we were able to get the earned income tax credit extended to um, folks who file their taxes with an ITIN number instead of social security, which includes undocumented immigrants and immigrants of various different statuses. So um, I'm over on my time. <laughs> I was just getting ready to jump in. <laughs> Yeah, our timekeeper is on, on the ball. <laughs> Thank you, that is Jessica Feldmark. Um, Jessica, I'm also going to ask you the next question. What does the term environmental justice mean to you? And will it be a priority for you as a legislator? And if so, specifically how? Thank you. So um, it, it is a priority for me. It, it has been a priority of mine and will continue to be. And, and to me, it really means um, making sure that people have um, equitable access to enjoying our environment. And that means enjoying a, a clean, safe, and healthy environment, right? So I think the, the sort of classic issues that we think of most in terms of environmental justice are you know, where and how we dispose of our waste and where and how we produce our power. Um, and so, you know, where these major facilities are located. I think um, those are very important issues and ones that we need to address. I also think in the context of climate change, we need to be looking at climate justice and what it means and how, you know, how the more severe weather we experience impacts um, households of different incomes, right? Making sure that people have access to heating and cooling centers um, in, you know, in periods of extreme heat and cold when they may not have adequate heating or cooling in their home. Um, making sure that we're looking at communities that are impacted by flooding and making sure that they have, um, you know, resources for remediation, including mold remediation, which is a major health threat 
um, for, for communities that are impacted by flooding. Um, and, and I also think access to green space is an important component of that. And looking at our green infrastructure networks throughout the state um, and making sure that communities, residential communities have direct access to green spaces, looking at tree equity um, and, and things like that to make sure that we are um, doing what we can to offset and, and mitigate the, the environmental injustice that we've seen um, up until this time. Thank you, Jessica, Jessica Feldmark. And same question for Terry Hill. Terry, would you like me to sure. repeat the question? No, no, but I'm good, thank you. So, you know, I'm gonna, you know, first say, uh, you know, me too, to everything that uh, my colleague Jessica said, and frankly, to what all the, the folks uh, here this evening said earlier, because it is all that. It is really, it's, it's how you swing your arm and whose nose do you hit, right? So, um, we have historically, you know, dumped our stuff in other people's yards. And historically, those people have been people of color. They've been people of, of lower income. They've been people who are on the margins because they don't speak the language. Um, and so when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about doing the things that are necessary with a conscious and intentional effort to undo the injustices that have already been put into place. It does go beyond Maryland, right? So we do have a role to play as a state that is important um, for the country, but it actually goes beyond that. So, you know, certainly communities of color, poorer communities, communities with aging infrastructure, right? Sewage systems that don't work, um, uh, public water that comes through lead leaching lines. All of those things are environmental issues. The green spaces, the, the, the three to four degrees of additional heat that you get in the city simply because there's not a green canopy. All of those things are important, but it's also important to think about what the United States of America is doing and how we're impacting other countries that don't have the same time frame and the same resources and how we how we're we affecting them. And just as a, as a really close example of what happens locally, we're talking about you know, changing everybody over to, to um, you know, in, uh, electric cars. Well, if you're living in a multi-housing you know, unit or you're living on a street where you don't have designated parking, a charging station is a really hard thing for you to have at your house. And I'm gonna leave it at that. So we need to have real conversations that put the people at the table who have been most disenfranchised. Thank you. Thank you for the answer, Tara Hill. Um, I'm also going to ask you, um, in the light of the leaked Supreme Court decision on abortion rights, do you think that we're doing enough at the state level to protect reproductive freedom or do we need to do more? Um, if you think we need to do more, what specific legislation will you sponsor or support? Sure. So, I, I mean, I think, again, um, everyone spoke to this issue very passionately and very intelligently. Um, it is, you know, the, the, the constitutional amendment, we already have a constitution that says that women's right to, to uh, health autonomy uh, is there. We do need to, to make it clearer exactly what we mean. We need to understand that what the Supreme Court is threatening to do is beyond abortion, as has been said, right? It's also about, can you use an IUD? because an IUD doesn't stop conception, it simply stops the embryo from implanting in the uterus, right? So I think we need to stop allowing the conversation to be about choice and abortion, and it's really about autonomy over one's own healthcare decisions. It's as simple as that, that's what we need to be talking about. And when we talk about these originalist jurists who wanna go back to what our forefathers were thinking about at the time, they need to go back and recognize that abortion, which has been going on since women were first created. And up until about 1890, I've recently learned, was just understood that before the quickening, before you could feel the baby move, women had the freedom to do whatever they felt was necessary to handle their business. So that's originalism. Okay, so unfortunately, we are in a position now where we feel like we have to fight this on a state basis, 
and there are some some assurances we need to put in place so that folks can't be uh, extradited to another state if they happen to break another state's law because they either assist someone or advise someone or leave the state to have abortion. And similarly, if they come to Maryland that they can't be extradited, that we're not gonna hand over medical records to assist in a, in, a, in, a, in a prosecution of somebody for coming to our state. So there are a lot of things that we need to do, but ultimately we need to go back to what we left behind you know, 40, 50 years ago when we didn't get that ERA ratified because women do not exist in our constitution. And until they do, everything that we think we enjoy as women is, is a gift, but it's not a right. That's Delegate Terry Hill. Thank you very much. And Jessica Feldmark, same question. Thank you. Um, so definitely wanna echo uh, what, what Terry said and what others have said before. Um, I was proud to co-sponsor the Pregnant Persons Freedom Act. I was disappointed that that did not pass this year, but um, was am, am very glad that we were able to pass the um, Abortion Care Access Act. And um, I do think we need to do more to, uh, in light of sort of what we're seeing on the horizon, and unfortunately it's not the distant horizon, right? It's a pretty close horizon um, to protect women um, and those who assist them. Um, both uh, within Maryland and to protect them from um, from out of state, uh, you know, increasing um, training to increase the number of providers, increasing the the number of um, types of medical professionals who can perform abortions are really important for improving access within Maryland. And that's going to be so much more critically important when we have an increased number of people uh, coming in from out of state seeking abortion care. Um, you know, this is uh, sort of full circle for me. My very first uh, political activity in Maryland was in 1992 as a college freshman um, canvassing in support of question six, uh, which was, you know, to, to codify Roe v. Wade. And, um, and it is something that I've been committed to. I have served on the board of NARAL Pro-Choice Maryland and um, has been, you know, it's just been such a fundamental issue and it is so disheartening to see us moving backwards. Um, you know, when the decision came out or didn't come out, was leaked, <laughs> when the leak came out last week, um, it was the first time in 22 years since my mother passed away that I was relieved she wasn't still alive because she didn't have to be here to see this. And um, it's just, we've, we've got to do more and I'm committed to doing that. Delegate Jessica Feldmark, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, guys, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's talk Liberty Act. Um, it's been challenged and it will appear on the ballot as a referendum in November. So would you support state legislation sim similar to the Liberty Act um, to protect the rights of immigrants? Um, I'll start with you, Jessica. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I would and I have. Um, you know, I think we have made uh, some, some important steps forward in terms of rights for immigrants at the state level. Unfortunately, we have not come as far as I would like. Um, and so we, we do have more work to do, but um, I, I absolutely support um, the, the Liberty Act and, and hope that uh, it will be successful on, on the ballot in Howard County and that we'll be able to um, replicate that at the state level as well. Thank you very much. Um, same question for Delegate Terry Ter Hill. You're muted. You're muted. Did we You're lose muted, her? Terry. She's muted. All right. I'm sorry. I was saying it's a me too. And, and, and to the point, I mean, it's something, you know, fighting for and supporting immigrant rights. Um, like, like Delegate Feldmark, um, you know, I also, you know, we're, we're both associate members of the Latino caucus, right? Because everyone needs allies, right? 
And because, and because of that, because there are so many associate members, the membership is like 70 members were strong. And when uh, Jessica talked about the earned income tax credit, that was a Latino caucus in conjunction with the Black Caucus and the Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus standing up to leadership and saying, who, who, who essentially said, we can't get this through. And we said, yeah, you can. And you can figure out a way to make this work. Um, so yeah, you know, try, trying, to, trying to make sure that, that folks in our country have um, the rights that uh, they, they, they should have as human beings while the federal government continues to struggle with fixing our broken immigration system. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Delegate Terry Hill. So that's the conclusion of our questions, the one we pulled from the chat previously, but we do always like to do a lightning round, um, pretty simple and direct. If we have 10 seconds on the clock, So I, I'm going to have to sort of wing it <laughs> because we lost our timer. We, the lost timer our we lasted a certain amount of time. And it's coming, Don. It's, it's coming. Oh, you got oh, to okay, wing okay. it with us. Okay. I can't speak for Jessica, but yeah, I have no sense of time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will talk. Okay. All right. So, hold on. Looks like it should be there. While we're waiting for the timer to come up, I will take a commercial moment from your sponsors to remind you <laughs> that um, tickets are out for the great race um, across Howard County. So go ahead and sign up. It's June 18th. We're looking forward to it. And we will be happy. Uh, there's the link there. Tickets are $10 to run the race. If you're a student or a senior, 25 for everyone else. And the block party is free. So come on out, guys. Have a great time. And let's meet some of our great Howard County Democrats um, and learn a little bit about, about some businesses and nonprofits in the process. So, so Cynthia, just a quick question uh, we had in discussing once or so. Will there be door knocking during the race? Will there be canvassing during the race? You know, I'm glad you asked. I'm actually hosting a Q&A on the 21st. So if you're not available, you can send a staffer. I will answer every single question any of you politicians have because this is something new and, and there are lots of questions. But we are looking for everyone to have at least three to five touch points for people during the uh, event. And we're looking a minimum of 200 people to sign up. Our cap is at 500. So probably more effective than a day of door knocking for some of you who are locally. And we're so excited to, to bring this opportunity to you all. So, um, but before we close out, I wanna take you a moment to give you guys a lightning round. So Delegate Hill, if with 10 seconds on the clock, we just wanna know your number one priority for next session. I'm still working on two number one priorities, making sure that kids who need glasses uh, get them so that they can be, you know, um, uh, so they can get what they need so they can learn. Um, and I'm also working on getting my mattress stewardship legislation through and okay. a couple other things. So those are the top two priorities for me. Okay, very good, thank you. And Delegate Feldmark, um, your top priorities? Well, thank you. Um, so in terms of broad issues, education continues to be my top priority because I think it is fundamental to all of the other issues we've discussed. In terms of specific legislative priorities, um, expanding what I did with the job creation tax credit to make sure that we're um, focusing our tax credits on creating good quality jobs um, so that they are serving the community, not just the private corporations. Okay. Very good, thank you. And to remind everyone, um, to, uh, we are grateful for our two incumbents, Delegate Terry Hill from District 12A and Delegate Jessica Feldmark from District 12A, um, joining with Team 12, which would also be Senator Clarence Lamb, we'll throw him in there. Um, and we are happy that you all joined us tonight. Um, I would remind you that we have our endorsement meeting coming up May 21st at the Wild Lake Interface Center. You can drive through or drop in. We try to make things easy. Um, and our and so you can cast your personal vote ahead of time to let us know who should actually garner the CDC endorsement in different races. So um, as far as these forums, yes, our May 5th forum from the County Council Board of Ed is now available on YouTube. How many of you guys knew we had a YouTube channel? 
I need you guys to look for it, um, subscribe, like and subscribe, and like some of the videos that are on there, whether we were at the We the People um, uh, rally, whether it's one of our candidate endorsements or some of the My Dem stories we did earlier in 2021. We're continuing to add content. Um, so please look for the Columbia Democratic Club. It's on YouTube. Just search under our name. And we will also be posting these forums, um, as you saw from the last one, on our social media. So you'll be able to see it um, across our social media lines. So we are definitely trying to amplify the messages that you all are bringing to your electorates. And we are thrilled that each of you bothered to show up and give us your message. And we're looking forward to endorsing a few of you um, going into the primary. So uh, remember, if you're not registered to vote, and I'm sure everyone on here is, but get registered to vote. And the primary is July 19th with all of the changes. So just putting out there. And last little change, I saw a note in the chat. Yes, we did have to change the date. The date of the great race across Howard County is the 18th of June. That is a Saturday. 